if you were to give me a bazillion dollars and say, here's Taylor Swift for a week, do what you like, you know, the PR in me is going to be like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> but also, what do we want to achieve from that? You know, so it needs to be, you know, a power that's used really carefully and cautiously in a way that is not going to necessarily create other problems. Mm. It's not a yes or no, right? It's a what do we want to achieve by this? I'm Dr. Louise Massara, and this is the Future Health Podcast. If Taylor Swift wears a new belt to lunch with Travis Kelsey today, it's sold out worldwide tomorrow. If we could motivate that same level of reliably responsive behaviour in our community around healthy behaviours, surely we could significantly impact the creation of a healthier population. Personal devices, social media platforms, they're all creating new channels for public and population health communications. But what health issues are we tackling? Who are our trusted messengers? And what can we apply from the science of behavioural insights to shift the public from awareness to action? At a moment in time when it feels like people have never been so influenceable, how can we influence people to do the right thing for a healthier future? Meredith Claremont is the Executive Director for the Centre for Population Health at New South Wales Health. She has 30 years experience in public policy across health, justice, environment and central agencies of government and she currently leads the statewide approach tackling modifiable health risk factors. Melissa Devine is a leader in strategic communication and health behaviour change, with 20 years experience in the public and private sectors in Australia and the UK. As the Director of Customer Information at New South Wales Health, she is responsible for communications and behaviour change strategies that support better health outcomes across our community. Welcome Meredith and Melissa. So Meredith, maybe we'll start at the beginning. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the key health issues that the Population Health Unit tackles? Yes. Yeah, so at the moment, we're really focused very much on vaping and e-cigarette control. That's probably the particular focus at the moment. But we're looking broadly at overweight and obesity, physical activity and nutrition, um, and also uh, sexually transmitted infections and, and how we can help the community around viral hepatitis uh, e-cigarette control is a really dominant issue for us. It's a major public health challenge that we're facing at the moment. We're seeing a rise in vaping rates around, uh, among young people that have really doubled in the last two years, which is really concerning. Um, the work that we're doing there is, you know, working across government, federally um, and across other agencies, as well as within the health system, um, to get the message out to young people about the harms of e-cigarettes and help them with nicotine addiction and to, to quit vaping because we know from them that they feel it's taking over their lives. I mean, that's interesting because I, I was going to ask whether you feel like the sort of modifiable health factors that mm. you're dealing with are pretty consistent over over time. But mm. I mean, you've just outlined an emerging problem. I suppose we weren't considering vaping as an issue 10, 15 years ago. That's right. Are there other issues that you think are sort of in that emerging space that mm. we should be turning our minds to? Yes, that's right. So with those modifiable risk factors, I think we've had terrific success with public health campaigns and um, interventions over a long period of time. Things like smoking, um, you know, amazing success reducing smoking rates in New South Wales. Um, similarly, with, with areas like HIV, we are in New South Wales, one of the world leaders in terms of reducing transmission of HIV. Mm. And also, we've been able to stabilise rates of overweight and obesity amongst young people and children for quite some time, but we haven't had success with adults, for example, um, with overweight and obesity, and we're seeing a big rise in obesity rates amongst adults. Um, and for children, we're seeing a decline in physical activity, which is a real concern. I think we're looking at you know changes, the, the changes and challenges that we're experiencing there are around um, the social media environment, um, you know, sedentary behaviour, and the challenges that parents have, you know, in time and energy for physical activity as a family. Those are some of the, the challenges there. We're also experiencing some increases in, in HIV in the community among particular populations. So as we have different overseas born people arriving who are coming from countries where we don't have the same sort of public health response around HIV, we're looking to reach those populations early um, and link them to testing and, and treatment. 
And syphilis is another issue that we're facing in New South Wales, as we are nationally, that's been on the rise, particularly amongst vulnerable populations. So that really, I suppose, leads us into some of the specifics of strategies, tactics and mm. tools at your disposal. You've, you've listed a whole series of audiences there. Um, do you use very specific um, tactics and tools for each of those target groups? We use probably some common uh, approaches across those domains. So mm-hmm. from a population health perspective, we we use epidemiology as one of the driving foundational aspects of the work that we do. Of course, understanding what the data is telling us about what's happening in the community. And we would also then use um, other types of information around um, audience segmentation research, around attitudes, behaviours and, and um, beliefs, barriers and so forth to individuals taking up behaviour change and then we would design programs and services with health professionals and the community and other organisations. So we use a bit of a systems approach across all of these areas but then we also need to look and drill right down. So when it's a single behaviour, smoking for example or vaping, we look at, you know, wrap around that sort of who are we talking about, who's got the what are the settings that those we need to reach those people in, and, and particularly young people, for example, um, or it might be, you know, with sexually transmitted infections, you know, which populations are affected, and sometimes it's our Aboriginal populations that are more affected than others, and so then we need to look at particular strategies and tactics that will work to reach those population groups, but are also done with those community groups themselves. So there's a lot of variation. Um, And we also know that the receptiveness of individuals varies across these different behaviours. So you've got to craft a message, reach an audience who then receive that information, believe it, and then hopefully take an action that you're directing them to do. I mean, that's a very human pathway with lots of potential pitfalls, I suppose. Mm. What's some of the science behind the sort of a good health comm strategy or is it more of an art? I mean, maybe that's something for you to, to touch on, Melissa. It's art and science, I think, is the it, to, to answer it as briefly as possible. I think one of the things about, um, you know, communicating health messages is that humans are quite complex, right? So we have different desires, wants, needs. Our lives are busy. We, we absolutely are driven by a whole manner of things when we go to make decisions. And one of the things that, we need to recognize is that is that people aren't actually all that rational right um it's it's about how we acknowledge that that way that we make decisions isn't necessarily looking at the empirical evidence so it's not a plus b equals c um so i can know what's good for me and i can understand those messages um but what might happen at the point where I need to modify my behavior is that there's a whole lot of things going on in my life that I can't really factor into that logical decision. So for example, I know that I need to go for a run and eat a salad, but in that moment of time, I'm going to justify my decision to sit on the couch, watch Netflix and eat a burger. And really what we can do to communicate is acknowledge that and craft our messaging and how we turn up in the lives of our audiences with that assumption that they're not rational. It's not just about the information, right? And there's a whole lot that goes on in your brain when you make a decision, right? The shortcuts that our brain uses when we look at information, when we go about our daily lives, because if we were to weigh up all the evidence, we would be exhausted, right? And extremely well. Yeah. Like, (laughs) you know, we have a lot of information about what it would be to make us healthy, well people in today's society, but you're quite right. There seems to be this yeah. this gap yeah. in the doing. And it's that intention action gap, yeah. right? So I know the right things, but do I do them routinely every day because of the health benefit that I understand I will get? Probably not. And there's a lot behind that. So it could be that the health benefit is far, far in my future. Mm. And I'm after that immediate sugar hit in Mm. terms of what it is that I've got to do. It could also be that I don't really fully understand what's what I need to do, that it's not particularly easy or that my environment is constructed in a way that isn't conducive to doing that behavior. And so I think what we are drawing on are those principles of behavioral science and cognitive biases that really we can embed across our strategies that reflect the complexity of what we're asking and 
really not everyone's motivated by better health in that moment because it can be abstract. And when you have a thousand other priorities, as Meredith alluded to, what's going to motivate you? And it could be something else. So you guys have to make decisions all the time about where you're going to focus your efforts. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it, it's a broad spectrum of issues that you're trying to address and deal with. What have been maybe some of the most successful campaigns that you've run to date? Well, right now we have one out in market around vaping. I might talk about that yep. as a current campaign. Um, and that's our Every Vape is a Hit to Your Health campaign targeted particularly at young people. And it's building on an earlier campaign that we did around Do You Know What You're Vaping, which was giving out that information to young people about what's in a vape. Most young people don't realise all the chemicals that are also there in a vape. The, the Every Vape is a Hit to Your Health campaign has been built on the stories that young people have told us about what's happening to them with vaping and how it's taking over their lives. The campaign uses direct testimonials of young people who've come forward um, to share their experience and how they've dealt with their vaping addiction and to encourage others to quit. So that's a very current campaign for us, which I think has been built on really solid foundations, that segmentation research that's told us about the particular campaign message that's going to resonate with young people. And it's got to be different to smoking. That's what's been really interesting about that. Young people are aware of all of the success of the smoking campaigns and don't see themselves as smokers. Mm. They don't realise that vaping is a similar nicotine addiction for them and the risks that are there. So we've had to really work quite differently on this campaign to really understand what's going to actually cut through um, and reach young people. Yeah. So... I mean, it would be interesting to have a conversation about um, any tension between memorability and effectiveness. I think anyone in Australia over the age of 40 remembers Norm mm. and the Life Be In It campaign. So I'm going to call that a highly memorable public health campaign. But I, I'm unaware of its sort of level of effectiveness. Was it an effective campaign? Well, unfortunately, despite the fact that we all remember Norm and, and there's a lot of fondness for Norm, um, we haven't really seen that follow through into changes in people's behaviour. So as I've mentioned, we've got uh, increasing rates of overweight and obesity amongst adults. We still have uh, challenges in in people eating those five serves of vegetables every day, um, two serves of fruit or the portion control, all of those sorts of things that build up to what the Life Being It campaign was really around and physical activity was part of that as well. Um, what we have learnt really in the work that we've done is the importance of when you're talking about multiple behaviours, which is what healthy lifestyles need, you've really got to understand what are the practical um, tools and information and advice that families or individuals need and then what other supports do they need so a campaign needs to be complemented by getting people linked into the supports that we can provide them in the messaging that we provide to to allow us to get to behavior change we need to be really practical and um, think about where people are really at and how to support them there. If we think about uh, a campaign as sort of any other health intervention, mm. if we sort of replace campaign with, with new drug, um, you know, we have to think about the risks, the side effects, sometimes the unintended consequences. Um, when we were all speaking before recording, um, I was asking a little bit about the, the other very memorable campaign in mm. my memory, which was the Grim Reaper campaign. Mm. And you shared a little bit about some of the unintended consequences mm. of that very memorable campaign. I wondered if you would talk a little bit about that with the audience. Yes, of course. Um, it was a, a campaign of its time, which was seeking to really get the message out about the threats of HIV. Um, and it is, again, a very memorable campaign. Unfortunately, it's led to a very long tail of stigma and discrimination um, towards people with HIV and to particular population groups who experienced a lot of discrimination as a result of that. So the community got the message that there was a risk and a concern, but associated that concern, uh, transposed the sort of grim reaper to gay men and created that image that gay men were the problem. Uh, and that's continued on that sort of residual underlying community belief, which has led to a lot of discrimination that 
gay men in particular have, have, have experienced as a result, and it's still there today. What, one of the things, I guess, that that throws up for us is when do you use a campaign that has a threat um, component, and you have to be very careful about that. You know, looking back at that time, people felt that the public interest and the public health concern, the crisis, warranted that type of campaign. Um, and I think we've learned a lot from that about how to connect and communicate with the community. Um, really, strengths-based messaging is the approach that we favour now in New South Wales, which, which is really leaves people with a strong sense of confidence in how they can take action rather than just raising that community threat and awareness. Mm. Melissa, how does social media specifically fit in the comm strategy at New South Wales Health? So social media, I guess, is a... Is, broad. <laughs> is very broad, is very broad. I suppose it offers, I guess, reach an opportunity to target and to really enter into conversations where they're being had online. I suppose when we look at the use of social media across our campaigns, but also across health, you know, I kind of, I remember back to when Instagram was coming into its own or even when, you know, Facebook was coming into its own. And there's this real flurry from organizations globally. We need to be in these spaces. And I think, you know, you have rogue accounts being set up and we're all on there. We want to be part of the conversation. We all want to go viral, you know, in a, in a good way. And I think what has happened over time is that that is a very, very time and cost intensive approach to, you know, a social media strategy or even using social media to reach people with your messages. And why I say that is because unless your audience is there and unless that's an environment where they are open and receptive to the type of information that you're willing to share, it maybe isn't the right place for you to invest. And so when we look at the use of social media through our campaigns and even how we engage with um, communities, it's not a, it's, it's free and easy, so let's just put it up there. There really is consideration for are the people that we need to reach in those social media spaces and places? And then uh, what are they doing there and how are we presenting the information in a way that is going to resonate and be effective for them? And I think we've come a long way since that we have to be everywhere all at once, get it out there into the world to being, we need to be a little more nuanced mm. because back to that unintended consequences piece, if you are putting, you know, messages into the world in front of people that aren't really meant for them, they're going to tune out. You become noise, yeah, okay. right? And how you present that information is important. So do you think that, you know, if, if we look into the next decade, uh, the people, the young people, the young people of today, the, the the teenagers of today have really grown up in a quite different technology environment yeah. and they're communicating in a different way. They're receiving messages in a different way. Mm. Do you see that that's going to have quite a profound change as you start uh, communicating with them more broadly as, as young adults? Uh, and so do you see your strategy shifting over the next decade in that social media space? Yeah. Yep. They'll need to, yep. right? I, just as they already have. So I think it's in social media, um, in particularly for young people, they're not necessarily listening to the likes of New South Wales Health mm. or other government organisations mm. all the time. So who they are listening to are their peers, what would be considered quote unquote influencers, yeah. but basically people who they see themselves as relating to because of shared interests, shared world views and that's what they're engaging with and where, who they're being influenced by um, and I include in that you know brands right health and non-health brands that you know are in a position to promise the world but but maybe the delivery on that isn't necessarily there and that's who we're mm. competing against but also needing to acknowledge through our strategies that you know, we are not, as a voice of authority, necessarily right to deliver the specific uh, message that we need young people to hear. So are you prepared to engage with sort of tro Trojan horses to bring yeah. your health messaging, you know, through the mouthpiece of something that is a, a trusted source for young people? Or, yeah. Or not even trusted. I think that's the wrong word. It's maybe just taking that authoritative feel out of the messaging. Yeah. And I think, you know, Meredith gave a great example of our vaping campaign as, as being that. So people... You know, to my point earlier, they don't necessarily think in terms of reason and logic. People think in stories, yeah, right? And so if you're able to tell a story through lived experience, you know, like the vaping campaign, 
or if you're able to, you know, follow someone's, you know, journey or trajectory through a, a health experience or a life experience as it intersects with health, that's really, that's really powerful and memorable. And it's also going to, I think, in terms of stickiness of message and impact, land a lot better with that young audience because, again, guaranteed way to have a young person do the opposite is to tell them what to do right yeah so especially if it's from a voice of authority yeah, okay. right they're there to challenge that it's ingrained in how their brain's developing it's what they must do and so to enter into a campaign mindful of that means that we take a different approach could i add another example there of course. um for us with our sti campaign so for Aboriginal audiences, we have a campaign called Take Blackshin. And this has um, been one we've set up over time with the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Centre as well, um, because we know that young people, and particularly Aboriginal young people, are a priority population for us there. So we have brought in Aboriginal comedians to develop up the messages and stories um, and f for us to put out on social media so that it's it's a bit more fun, it's um, much more relatable, it's people that the audience that we're trying to reach know mm -hmm. and kind of trust and identify with. And I think that sort of campaign approach for us has worked really well. So we get over 6 million views, for example, in a year of, of those um, social media outputs for us, which tells us that it's working. But we have to keep on top of it because things change, you know. Yeah, I was going to say, how quickly can an organisation, mm. an institution like New South Wales Health respond to sort of social movements, social trends? Mm. You know, TikTok comes up with something. You were just saying we can't be everywhere and all the time. Um, but do we do we have that agility to be responsive to certain trends? Well, you know, it is challenging in government because yeah. of the points that we've just discussed about also, you know, not just our brand, but also re respecting our brand and retaining mm. that brand. So it has to be authoritative and we have to be careful that we don't move too quickly and that we've done, we've given sort of due diligence to the approach. But we're constantly reviewing how our campaigns are uh, working, how they're landing, what the reception of that is and adapting um, the approach. So we use, you know, different comedians, for example, each year. But we also get that feedback from people about, you know, maybe that approach becomes tired and we need to think about a new approach. So we're just in the process at the moment of doing a bit more research around what would be maybe the next step for us with a campaign like that. Melissa, as personal devices, um, well, I mean, they're ubiquitous now and wearable devices are becoming more prevalent. Do you see that, that these sort of channels are offering something new when you're developing your comm strategies? If we think ahead into the future, right? So on a daily basis, we probably have more information in our pocket about our health that we're able to capture or through our smartwatch than ever before. And that's only going to increase, right? So that real time feedback that we're getting from technology. And there's huge potential in that, right? Not only to help us modify our behaviors when done well, but also giving us the opportunity to use that from a communications perspective. And I think in the future, if you were to, you know, give me a crystal ball and I look in it and I think, where are we heading? You know what, one day, just as, you know, social media was at one point novel and new, at another point, maybe wearables and personal technology is going to be another channel that we use for communicating or to at least leverage to achieve a particular behaviour or result. And that's not necessarily something that, you know, is right for everything, everywhere, all at once. But I think there there may be the, the potential to do that. So with that, of course, would come a whole lot of considerations and risks and how would that work? But I think um, I think there's the potential to take a, a very personalised approach to population yeah. health. Mm. And that's incredibly powerful potentially, but would come with a whole lot of responsibility on, you know, how we modify behaviour using that real-time feedback data and the channel that is something like a wearable device. And we have to think about also... You know, who are we trying to reach? Because as we've discussed, you know, there's a part of the community that we might be able to successfully reach through through those new channels. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to remember that a lot of the community also don't have those mm -hmm. channels and can't afford those devices and don't have access to them. Yeah. And so for us, we have to 
be thinking all the time in terms of those segments and our responsibility towards those members of the community who need greater support from us. So I think health has that challenge, doesn't it, with the approach that we're taking, which is to be contemporary and relevant, but also inclusive appropriate and, yes, and inclusive. Yeah. And we really have to think about equity and our responsibility to reach those groups that most need um, not only the messaging, but connecting them to services and care. You mentioned a little earlier um, that, you know, perhaps one of the issues associated with childhood obesity and physical activity is that increased use of device yes. um, and, and, and lifestyle for mm. families. Everyone's on the device, not just the kids. You know, we hear a lot about the, the negative aspects of that. Mm. But uh, does this give health a chance to be talking directly to children in a way that they really haven't been able to f- direct a message before? We've Historically, you you would direct a message to parents mm. and parents through to children. Are there unintended opportunities as a result of this sort of change in the way young people are spending their time? It's a good point that you're making there. I, I think we haven't really explored that opportunity um, and how it could be effective for us. We do, as you say, reach parents, but also children through key settings. So as I talked about before, the approach that we take is is to um, lay down sort of lifestyle behaviours with kids early on. So in early childhood settings or in primary schools, we have a lot through the curriculum and other programs that help kids to understand, you know, about their healthy veg snack break, you know, physical activity break, those sorts of things. A lot of those programs are well known. Um, So we've been doing that more directly through those settings in which we can reach kids directly um, and and through those sort of early childhood teachers and Mm. primary school teachers. But we do try and reach the families as well. So we have been more approaching parents, but the family as a whole. So some of the programs that we run bring families together to learn about how to have fun again as a family, being sort of active and playing games. Um, It's something that some families have sort of lost that thread with it. And and so we try and bring a sort of fun aspect to that uh, and a low cost aspect. But you're right, there might be new opportunities for us in how we kind of reach kids in other settings and and, um, we need to stay on top of the evidence around Mm. what is effective there. I'll just add one point to that is that it's not necessarily that it would be new in practice, right? So if you replace the screen with the television, so Mm -hmm. personal device as opposed to, you know, the glowing box in the corner of the room, we have, and, you know, organisations, brands, health communicators, um, and also, you know, taking that health and education dual lens when you think of some of the you know some of the early childhood content that comes through the glowing box in the corner through being able to educate through play song you know that kind of interactive digital engagement that's already happening Mm -hmm. you know I mean my kids love the wiggles and know about the virtues of fruit salad um, through that right so it's not necessarily that that's a new space but how it's engaged with and the interactivity um, is different. Um, but I think as a, as a principle, that's, qu- that's quite established and longstanding. Whether or not it's entirely effective, you know, we'll look at that. But I think it's about taking what is effective in that kind of, you know, engaging directly with children from an educational but also, you know, from a, an entertainment storytelling perspective is really powerful. And it's not necessarily new. It's just how you hold it in your hand that's changed. And, and maybe the um, the quantum of time spent. Uh, I think, you know, yeah. we were all controlled. If it's a glowing um, box in the corner, I think it's a it's a, a limited interaction yeah. in, in a different way. Um, Melissa, you referenced earlier the, um, you know, that we should all, potentially with the information at our fingertips, uh, be a healthier community than maybe we are if, um, if we were all more rational beings Mm. given that we're not rational beings Mm. what is the sort of the thought leadership around making that jump to an action what are the people in your sort of roles what are you thinking what's the cutting edge how are we going to make that transition from from knowledge to action yeah look there's no silver bullet and I think Meredith made a really good point earlier many good points earlier but the one that um, is particularly important to consider is that how we communicate through campaigns or even just the information that we make available or the way we design environments for the community n- none of that is is on its own going to you know monumentally change a behavior it needs to be part of a number of levers that are able to be pulled at any 
given point to create the conditions conducive to positive behaviours, whatever that may be. So what does it look like in terms of, you know, our work in that space? I think what's really brilliant, and it's been going on for a little while now, is that nexus between art and science, which is what has historically been seen as more of an art form, which is communication, so campaigns, the creative, the stories, right, the connection and engagement with the science that is the behavioural science, right? So Nudge. 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 All of the principles of behavioural economics, right? But to apply them um, not just on a on a small scale, but to apply those principles as we design campaigns, communications, how we how we frame, how we acknowledge the cognitive biases that exist, is really powerful. One of the great things, though, is that you know my communications and marketing colleagues in the big wide world, they might not necessarily all uniformly use the same language of behavioural science, but because it's been through practice, tried and tested, you know, and and looking at what works, you know, positive framing, for example, is something or, or role modeling is another really powerful thing where if you see someone that's doing something that you see a bit of yourself in that and you can relate to it, that's going to be a more compelling and effective way to tell that story and to engage with that person. Now, whether or not, you know, as communications people, we kind of do that, right? They We put that into our strategies, but probably not conscious of the fact that that's actually kind of an evidence-based approach to doing it. So I think there's a huge area where we can bring that nexus together more consistently and uniformly, mm-hmm. which will it'll always be a little bit trial and error in terms of effectiveness, but it reduces, I think, some of the less effective communications that we put into the world because there's a side effect for every intervention. Comms is no different. Right. Mm -hmm. So being able to draw on kind of established frameworks, behavioral science principles and bring them into our campaign strategy with the acknowledgement that people are irrational, people are complex and different. And it's not always the information that they have that dictates the behavior. It's a whole lot of things. And unless we take that full view and where comms can play a role, we're probably going to miss a trick. If we think a little bit about influencers, um, mm. I use that term broadly, but in the context of what you're saying, in, in, even in role modelling, yep. we, we've seen a lot of impact on community behaviour when um, celebrities or well-known people talk to us about a health issue, yep. whether on their own or as part of a campaign. I'm I, thinking a little bit about Angelina Jolie and the impact that she had. And to your point, I think sometimes um, the intention and outcome, we can control the message, as in mm-hmm. we can express a message. What that trickles down into in terms of effect in the community is sort of out of the hands of the communicator. Mm. And I think the Angelina Jolie story is a, is a good example of where um, certainly awareness was increased. But from my reading around this recently, I understood for the first time that a lot of women um, were making choices around surgeries that were maybe... Um, unrelated to the BRCA gene, inappropriate um, because of the the modelling, the role modelling of Angelina Jolie and her decision making. This raises a lot of concerns and questions around the potential advantages and disadvantages of using uh, personalities and celebrities as spokespeople for issues. Mm. Is this something you have to grapple with? Yeah, all the time. Well, I think it's it's something that I think there's a, there's an assumption that that sugar hit right of a high profile celebrity will 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 give you will change the outcome, and I think there's always room for multiple voices, high profile voices in any health conversation because, you know, one of the things that um, that we need to consider is around that awareness piece. So increasing the salience of certain health topics. But also that plays into some what's known as availability bias. So if I can easily and readily draw upon information that I've had right in front of me that's memorable, I'm going to hold that information and and draw on it, right? So the Angelina effect being one. The other, like Shane Warne, right? The the impact that his, you know, untimely death had on, you know, an audience of primarily men of a certain age being more aware of their their cardiac health, right? Mm. So it does have, it does have an impact now, how you, how you measure whether that's effective? Well, are you looking at it for, you know, what are people talking about? 
is that awareness raised and what is then the impact in terms of how does that translate into individual health choices and behaviours. And I think as a, as a health community, we owe it to ourselves to not underestimate or minimise or dismiss um, the, the power of that celeb factor, right, power, reach and influence, but to also at the same time in the lives of the people that we serve, to also make sure that they're not necessarily replicating it, you know, or, or, or confusing it with, you know, health advice. Yes, right. And I think, you know, we know time and again that for many health behaviours, um, the greatest influence in our lives is our trusted health professional. Mm -hmm. So we can do all the communicating in the world on cer certain health topics and tell you to do certain things. But if you're sitting down with your doctor and they say, oh, you know, Melissa, you're due for your, you know, your pap test or Melissa, you're due for your, you know, your breast screen or I'm going to do it right? I'm going to do it more likely mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. they tell me so as opposed to something that I, that I may read. Now, we still have to have the information out there because it's an important influencing factor. Um, but I think when it comes to that celebrity effect, yeah. we have an obligation in those moments to acknowledge the impact and um, almost you know, use the power of it to have a conversation about suitability, relevance. It, does this matter to you? Mm. And have a real and honest conversation about it and not dismiss it as trivial. I think that's important too. In terms of campaign design though, um, you know, if, if you were to give me a bazillion dollars and say, here's Taylor Swift for a week, do what you like. I mean, you know, the PR in me is going to be like, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> but also, what do we want to achieve from that? You know, so it needs to be, you know, a power that's used really carefully and cautiously in a way that is not going to necessarily create other problems. Mm. It's not a yes or no, right? It's a what do we want to achieve by this? And and is it going to actually have the long term benefit across the community's health outcomes that, that we want? New South Wales, authoritative, credible, trusted in your the team that you work in is there any tension between that sort of credibility and creativity uh, or do you feel that they really can go hand in glove they can go hand in glove and i think probably where you know, there's always going to be tension points right always how do how do we push the limit on this message with this audience and again where that happens it's going back to the evidence Right. So if if we know that communicating about something in a certain way is going to, you know, hit the mark for audiences that aren't, you know, Meredith or I or mm -hmm. anyone else that is a decision maker, acknowledging step one, we are not the audience. Yeah. And then designing it in a way that's going to be most effective. And if that's taking a creative approach that we wouldn't necessarily take as part of, you know, the New South Wales brand approach, we need to have that conversation and that's OK. Right. An example of that would be the campaign work we do with HIV and sexually transmitted infections where we know that to reach those audiences we'll need to use certain terms um, and, and a kind of an, an engaging approach that's really pushing some of the limits of New South Wales Health mm -hmm. and this is a constant sort of area where we need to work closely with Melissa's team around that we're not being gratuitous around that but that it does have a public health underpinning kind of reason for doing it. So that's an area also where we may um, engage non-government organisation to develop that ca campaign on our behalf and deliver it with government branding, but also it's coming from a trusted sort of community organisation as well in partnership with mm. us that gives the community that sense of relatability and um, also assurance that the messaging is is public health uh, and New South Wales Health endorsed, but also um, that the organisations that they trust are on board with that as well. In clinical medicine and in innovation in healthcare, we're constantly trying to avoid reinventing the wheel by looking at best practice everywhere in the world and, and what's mm. um, translatable to an Australian context. Do you do the same? Are there uh, amazing campaigns that have been hugely successful at other places in the world that we can lift and, and replicate here? Or is the nuance of audience, um, does it make, make that impossible? Well, I guess we're always looking at what's working and why it's working, but it is context specific. We have to really be aware of that. And sometimes it's challenging even to get national campaigns that resonate across all communities in Australia. Um, at a state level, we, we also, uh, you know, we take an approach. We, I, I talked before about, for example, healthy living, um, some 
Other states will use a more threat-based approach around, um, you know, there's a Live Lighter campaign in Western Australia, which is really about, you know, um, healthy eating. Uh, we don't sort of take that approach in New South Wales because mm -hmm. we want to take a more strengths-based approach. So we do look at the evidence of how that's working, but we also look at what some of the consequences of that might be. Um, and as we've discussed sort of a few times here, I think what we're learning more and more about with our campaigns is that those messages need to be delivered by people that are relatable to the audience in New South Wales and sometimes in just components of New South Wales, just some audiences in New South Wales. I think, you know, what we've done well with the Every Vape is a hit to your health is the Cancer Institute who developed and is delivering that campaign have done all the underpinning work with young people to understand what the messages are that will be relatable here in New South Wales. We're looking at what other jurisdictions and internationally is being done around vaping campaigns, of course, to understand, you know, what messages resonate. And sometimes it's good to have different approaches because you sort of capturing different parts of the community with different messaging. But it's not necessarily been that great for us as an opportunity to take an existing campaign from somewhere else and just run that here. Our hospitals are constantly under pressure with a flow of patients coming in and we're hearing all the time about a drive for more beds. Um, it feels so much like the piece of work that you're doing is really one of the main weapons we have in uh, creating a sort of sustainable healthcare system uh, where we really can focus on those pieces of prevention that might narrow the funnel into acute care. I wonder if uh, you're feeling that there's a shift in priority and resource uh, and attention into the sorts of areas that you're both working in now in recognition of that. I think everyone's committed to having an investment in prevention in New South Wales and certainly future health itself is really emphasising the need for us as a health system to um, shift that balance to community and preventive health care. Um, that's not easy because um, the pressures on the system, you know, do drive a focus on the need to, to treat people with advanced disease or, you know, emergency health mm -hmm. needs. So it's a constant I think constant approach that we need to take across New South Wales Health of looking at, well, how can we connect these strategies and approaches? Um, there's a lot of drivers to that and it's a changing and dynamic environment. I think, you know, the community has changed a lot in the last few years and we've had to update the approaches that we're taking. Um, but also there's such a critical role for the health system to play in prevention. We've talked before about how campaigns need to be supported by other activities and the brief intervention and referral, the trusted health professional providing that brief intervention and referral to services is mm. so critical mm. for prevention. Just take smoking. You know, as people come into the hospital system, they're routinely asked if they're smokers. A quick brief intervention at that point to, to explain the importance of that, a referral to Quitline or another service that can support that person can really be quite an, a significant intervention at that point. Mm. But it is, I think, a real tension point for any health system to shift some of that balance towards the preventive health and, the commu and care in the community. The other way of looking at it is that health isn't necessarily exclusively health property. <laughs> yes. So when you look across yeah. all of the determining factors of what makes someone, you know, have better or poorer health outcomes, let's look at the day in the life of and the other systems that we engage in, the socioeconomic considerations, the cultural considerations, even the, you know, the social and commercial determinants of health, mm. you know, they span every element of society. And it really is that kind of, you know, that holistic, all encompassing, you know, approach that can be and has been proven to be quite powerful. So I think it's it's kind of resetting a little bit the lens through mm, which we mm. look at it. And this all sounds very lofty and in practice is completely well, different. I mean, but Meredith, maybe think, could you give us an example? I mean, mm. I think what you're reflecting is that it's, it's not a health portfolio issue in a lot of cases. It's many tiers of government coming mm. together um, and the, the private sector and corporate yeah. world and all mm. coming together. Can you think of an example of where we have taken a sort of a whole of government approach to an issue? Yes, I can. And, and I'm going to return to the topic of vaping because it's so, it's so current. At the moment, we're working, health agencies are working together nationally. 
um, as and, and at the state level, we're working closely with um, police, education. Um, we're working with uh, clinicians. Um, we're working across the board. So we, we have to use all the tools at our disposal mm -hmm. with something like addressing e-cigarette use in New South Wales. So we have um, a compliance com component to that. So health is providing along with police, we do our enforcement and compliance because that's about getting the product out of the market and out of kids' hands. Education's dealing with that in the schoolroom. It's it's one of the key issues that education has been dealing with there. And, and we've been working closely, um, recently had a, a ministerial round table around that, hearing from students about how it's affecting them, hearing from teachers, working together with education around the tools and resources that we can share um, to support young people who are getting addicted to nicotine there. So that's about what are the health services in that case that can come in and support young people. The education campaign that Cancer Institute's developed is one component. But nationally, the the health ministers, um, this is one of their top priorities um, mm -hmm. for the last 12 months, is to develop a coordinated, consistent national legislative framework um, to address the issue. So we've already got new border controls the Therapeutic Goods Administration works, their enforcement team works with my enforcement team and local police uh, across New South Wales on um, our operations. So, you know, there's lots of different levels at which we're working. And yeah. then, of course, um, sharing resources nationally. Um, that's really important. So it is one of those issues that, you know, we have to bring a whole range of people together on. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that the health system is responding on and, and and we do have measures in place to support these preventive health actions and there is a willingness and and support by health professionals and clinicians to be part of that mm. um, there's just so much pressure on the system to deliver core health business which i think makes it challenging and that's where sort of health promotion comes in so our health promotion teams across local health districts are providing that sort of two-facing approach so the community and government facing approach as well as working with the health system mm. around that change so you talked before about how can we support clinicians with that information and education and our health promotion services are really doing a lot of that work to provide you know that that um, targeted education and support to health professionals so that they can play the role that they need to play mm. that supports this much bigger whole of government response. Now, neither of you rejected the offer of Taylor Swift earlier, <laughs> um, but if we were going to put $100 million on the table and we played that game before, what would both of you do with $100 million to play with in the public health space? I, I My mind just went straight to communities. So I, I think I'd be thinking about how we could get that down to the community level. So really well understanding how we would communicate with a lot of our called communities, our Aboriginal communities. Um, those priority populations would be top of my list doing the work. You know, we don't often have the investment that we need to really um, resource the communications in those communities around behaviour change. And then I, I'd have to say I'd be thinking about some services as well that would be linking in with that. That would be me. What about you, Mill? Oh, well, if it's not going to be Taylor Swift, I agree with Meredith, right, in in terms of if I had $100 million to play with, um, you know, I would be looking really carefully at that balance. So that balance between service provision um, and, you know, making sure that, you know, people have access to, um, you know, the right care that they need at any given moment, but also the information they need through preventative services. And also balance that with what is the role that communications needs to play as part of that as opposed to we're going to communicate the life out of something and hope that people end up where they need to be so i'd probably take that 100 million and I'd carve it up i don't know i'm going to say 50 50 um <laughs> but you know there's no greater um intervention than a personal one mm. so if i were to you know Absolutely. Have a have a door knock, you know, your your local doctor, you know, <laughs> knocking on your door and, and giving that kind of personal that personal message. There's nothing nothing more effective, right? But we're not gonna get that, you know, at scale at the right time every time. But it would be something that would support that mm. in addition to um, increasing mm -hmm. the health literacy of the community mm -hmm. to be able to receive and understand the information that's in front of them because everything over that will be a lot, a lot easier. 
Meredith, Melissa, I think this is a fascinating area and I appreciate you coming in and talking to us a little bit about the, the future of public and population health and communications in New South Wales health. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.